Poppies for young men. Such bitter. Is it trade? Trade. I love that Josh Groban, personally. What the hell? Is he here? Yes, he's behind the boxes. Wow. <laughs> hey, everybody. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry. Did, did, did you did announcer man want to say something? <laughs> I guess Probably usually not. he does, doesn't he? He does intro us. Let's let him go. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm an answer man. Yeah, wow. Exactly. Yeah, he's back, he's back there. That's where his booth used to be. You can't see it anymore because of the boxes, but, uh, you know. You want to tell people what the boxes refer to? Yeah, if you haven't been listening to That Gets My Goat... They haven't. A, you should be ashamed of yourself. I think Big is right. B, I made an announcement over there on one of our shows in which I informed the world, and that's you guys, you're you're the world, that my wife has uh, gotten herself a job in Houston, Texas, and I am moving away. Rich Outfield and I will no longer be able to do podcasts like this in which we sit across the room from each other. We're going to have to do it like all those other podcasters who podcast via Skype. Which, we've done that before too, uh, on occasion when we're just like, oh, we're not going to be able to get together, so we instead got together later over Skype and the good thing about that is it's really easy to edit those right I mean you don't have to worry compared about compared to the other way right exactly you don't have to worry about that you know where you just interrupt me and said compared to you can't edit that out because it's over the top and it's not going to fix itself and you can't edit that little slurping noise that you made with your drink right now either it's uh Yeah, see, that's going to be in there because I was talking when you did it. But you could edit that out if they were on two separate files that we just recorded while we were talking on Skype. So it's going to make your editing life a little easier. Unfortunately, we won't be able to hang out like this anymore, which um, is fun. Uh, You know, one of those things that we like to do. The good thing about that for the listener is we're probably going to do way more shows than we've been doing Because that's what we'll do when we, you know, call each other up is record ourselves talking, I guess. And so we'll have probably shows that hit much more often. I believe it when I hear it, but okay. (laughs) Instead of the days where we get together and we're like, well, why don't we just hang out? We'll watch a movie tonight. Maybe we'll like go to a bunch of different Walmarts and see if they have any good toys. Well, like one of the things that I had wanted us to do for the longest time. Whoa, oh, the longest, oh, the longest time. time was I got a canoe for my birthday last year and I only used it once, <laughs> but I was, I kept saying one day, you know, when the weather gets warm, I'm going to bring that canoe out and we're going to go on the lake and we're just going to paddle around. It's going to be great. And today I finally was like, Hey, we got to do that. Let's do that before we eat yeah. or whatever, before the sun goes You're down. Like it's our last chance. We got to do it. We have to do it. Exactly. That's 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 what I was thinking. Yeah. So I brought it, and you drove us out to the lake, and we got out on the ship. We carried the dang bag full of the canoe. The canoe is an inflatable canoe. It's not a hard-sided one that, you know, you would strap to the roof, I guess. This thing was just in a little bag, and yeah, we, we carry it. It's pretty heavy. I mean, it's not yes, like it's 500 very heavy. pounds or something, but it's probably 50 pounds, and we lugged this thing all the way out. Got to the shore, opened the bag, unrolled the canoe, and found that the pump was nowhere to be found, nor were the paddles. Like I said, I only used it once last year. <laughs> Just once. And the pump and the paddles were gone? <laughs> you probably completely lost them. You'll never use it again That's... unless you pump it up with your mouth. Oh, can you imagine how long that would take? <laughs> how many blood vessels you would pop in your brain? <laughs> It's like Rich Outfield, dead today. Took his own life by trying to pump up a canoe. That is not the way we expected him to go. 
said local authorities. <laughs> we were much more expecting autoerotic asphyxiation, but we also did have good money on something stupid. <laughs> well, I, I think in the Vegas odds would pay out on that of trying yeah. to blow up a, yeah. a two-man canoe with your mouth. <laughs> Anyhow, sorry. So it's so. This is it. This is the last time we'll be getting together ever again. Yeah, it's, and it's not going to happen much more. Pretty certainly, the last time we'll be in this room together. The weekend that I'm moving is the weekend that Wonder Woman comes out, and I'm insisting to Rish Outfield that we will see it on Friday night and record a podcast about it immediately afterwards. And, and if you're not listening to that, gets my goat. A shame on you. You should be. And B. Uh, you'll find that podcast over there if you do want to listen to it. I think Big is right. Okay, stop saying that. <laughs> it just creeps me out that he just stands there. Yeah, it's just back behind there. Like he's built like a little fort or something in there. It's We already packed up all this stuff from his, his booth, but whatever. Um, so this may be the last time that I'm in a room with Announcer Man as well. Yeah, that's probably true. Except for the fact that Announcer Man retired a year ago. Was it a year Almost. Wow. I, don't, I don't know if it's been quite that. But. I remember you took a picture and posted it on Facebook of you and Announcer Man on his last day. Did I? You I did. I think I posted it. Don't give me that. I think sh- I wanted to post it, and I was just like, should I post it? And then I never did. You did. Did I? Did I? Stop that. <laughs> I have no idea why you would do that. That's just, it's not endearing at all, sir. Okay, so... I said, well, let's do the paddle boat thing. Let's do the the one thing that... I've been talking about for almost a year, and we've mm-hmm. never done. Uh, and when I, then we couldn't. And then I said, well, well, maybe we'll just go back to your place and uh, record long overdue podcasts. Yeah, there and, you go. And so here we are. Yeah, recording a long overdue podcast. So long overdue that the author was just like, oh, hasn't that run already? I, oh, I already published it somewhere else now. It's already won a nebula now. You're You're way too late. Or it's something like that. Not far <laughs> off the mark there, actually. But yeah, just just if what you say is true and we start to podcast again in the future once you're down in Texas, I just want it to be known that you folks that, that send us stories can publish them wherever you want. You can put them on your blog. You can send them to Clown Pod for all I care. <laughs> we don't have... What do you call it? Exclusive, uh, exclusive rights. rights to the stories. We, we, it's something we have never bought. The exclusive only, rights. The only time that we ever have addendums to our contract is if you wrote it for our contest, and we would like to put it on our, our show first. But even then, we won't do anything if you ran it somewhere else or yeah, sent well, it somewhere we else. Might, we might send in Robocop, but that's probably all. Or maybe a, a Predator. Okay, I, I didn't know we had that option. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things that comes with uh, registering your domain through GoDaddy. Did you register it with GoDaddy? I thought it was Libsyn, dude. <laughs> no, Libsyn is who hosts the files on their podcast. GoDaddy is where I registered the website domain. It's just one of those perks, you know. It just comes along, or or, or also you, Danica Patrick can do a guest spot on your show. There's, there, there's several things that you can choose from. Well, we should have chosen that one. Oh, well, sorry. I already clicked the box for the Predator. Okay. So that's really all we can pick. Look at her. She's scared out of her mind. Well, okay, so I guess we've got a story for everybody as well. Oh, we do? Yeah. Oh, we, oh, is that what we were getting? We're so out of practice. I didn't There's realize like, we were going to get to it that. It was one of those where we talk for a half hour and then say, oh, yeah, you know what? Somebody <laughs> sent us a story. That was actually why we got together. I, <laughs> this today's story is actually really good, folks. This as takes, opposed to last time. <laughs> this takes me back to like the early days of the show or something like that. You know, there were times when we just had a great story after a great story, just week after week. This this one just makes me feel like those those old days. You know, where where the story is really great. Maybe I'm pumping this up too much. Hopefully, I'm I'm not making people. Oh, yeah, well, you know, you get that, that syndrome that you get where it's like, oh, my God, Avatar was so great. It was amazing. And then you go to, you know, uh, I mean, 3D was cool, but you made it sound like it was the greatest thing ever. Hopefully I'm not doing that because that can backfire. But uh, I love this story. I thought it was really great. And on top of that, I really enjoyed our 
version of it, production. our audio production of it. It was it turned out really well. Okay, so tell us about today's author. Oh, did we, have we even said who it was? <laughs> no, we haven't. So <laughs> intro him, man. Lay out his CV for us. Okay, so uh, the story today is called Scare Tactics by Aaron Rudell. Unusual first name, unusual last name. A-E-R-Y-N. Oh, okay. That is a little unusual. Little? Sorry. Just, just a smidge. Just a titch. Is a titch more than a smidge? I'm not How sure. How many smidges are in a titch, sir? I think it takes three titches to make a smidge. Ah, okay. How about a scotch? Oh, a scotch. There are okay, a couple yeah, of that's... extra scotches in a smidge. About the author. Uh, so Aaron Rudell is a freelance writer from Seattle, Washington. He is a notorious dinosaur nerd, a rare pole arms expert, a baseball connoisseur, and he has mastered the art of fighting with sword-shaped objects, but not actual swords. Aaron's short fiction has appeared in Dark Fuse magazine, mm. Pseudopod, oh. and Red Sun magazine, Ooh. among others. And his first novel, Flashpoint, was recently published by Privateer Press. Aaron, occasionally... Oh. Sorry, what? Sorry, I'm just, I, I forgot to do my little reactions to each thing, and you said Privateer Press, and then I... Oh, I need to... Ooh. Do you, are you familiar with Privateer no, Press? No, I'm not. I'm not familiar with anything. I'm, I'm pretty clueless. Aaron occasionally offers dubious advice on the subjects of writing and rejection. Mostly rejection. Aww. On his blog at www.rejectomancy.com. <laughs> Rejectomancy. Do you always say W? No. Or I just is this it just... Fun. It's like when you say sorry all the time. Oh, stop it. I don't do that. <laughs> say you're sorry. Come on. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That was out of line, eh? <laughs> okay, enough of the drama. Let's uh, continue with Scare Tactics. Scare Tactics. tactics of the Galactic Rim. Tactics. Tactics. Scare Tactics by Aaron Rudell. Lindsay pulled up to the curb, killed the Accord's engine, and glanced out the passenger side window. The house was small and well kept, and the surrounding neighborhood agreeably upper middle class. The newish Lexus ES350 in the driveway said her prospective clients had money. Not millions or anything, but more than enough to afford her services. She got out of the car and went around to the trunk. She popped it open and made a face at the awful stench that wafted up from the dark enclosure. It was a pungent mix of the worst fart overlaid with rotting meat and old garbage. Ah, oh, Jesus, she said, covering her mouth. Can't you control that? Within the trunk, lying face up, was a jumbo-sized Raggedy Ann doll that had seen better days. Its pinkish cotton face was pocked with moth holes, its once bright dress dirty and stained. Only the red yarn that served as its hair retained its original color. A Dromalek's voice drifted up from the doll, faint and irritated. You know I can't help it, the demon said. You keep a demon in physical form. You get the stink. That's just the way it is. Maybe you shouldn't stick me in a small, enclosed space. And have that stench up front with me. No thanks, she said. Hey, switch to silent mode. It's almost showtime. Are we doing this again? Lindsay heard a Dromalek's voice in her head now, as she'd requested. It wasn't quite telepathy. He couldn't read her thoughts, just like she couldn't read his. But they could hear each other when they wanted. It's demeaning, you know. I'm a I'm demon of the first, of the first order, order, a goddamn, goddamn chancellor of hell. hell. I'm not I'm some, some bullshit scare artist. artist. Lindsay stifled a chuckle. Chancellor, my ass. I've read De Plancy, and he says you were nothing more than Satan's fashion consultant. She could feel a Dromalek's anger surge against the back of her brain a red haze of demonic power that would be terrifying if she didn't have complete control over its source. 
De Plancy was an asshole and a liar, Adromalek said. His voice was a droning buzz, like a thousand angry flies. Most of what's in the Dictionnaire Infernal he got from Titivus, the biggest fucking liar in hell. And I don't need to tell you that's saying something. I commanded 15 infernal legions, and I was the... Yeah, yeah. I've heard this before. Lindsay cut the demon off. You were a big deal in hell. Well, if that was the case, maybe you should have stayed there, rather than acting like the boogeyman in a cheap horror flick. She'd had a drama lick for five years, acquiring him in the one and only case in her entire parapsychology career that actually was supernatural. Don't be a bitch, a drama lick said, a noticeable pout softening his insectile rasp. Eternity is boring. Possession breaks the monotony. How was I to know you would know that one spell that A actually works and B would bind me to this stupid doll? When she'd encountered a Dromalek and the college girls he'd been tormenting, she had immediately realized the opportunity. She performed an exorcism that contained a bit of Haitian voodoo mixed into the Latin. The exorcism was for show. The Haitian spell, however, had trapped a Dromalek in the doll he'd been using to terrorize Sorority Row for the term of 66 years. The spell also bound him to her will for that same period of time. Self-pity is an unbecoming trait in a demon, Lindsay said. Face it, you're stuck, and this is how I... Check that. We make a living. She scooped the doll out of the trunk and held it up, staring into the vacant depths of its glassy eyes. Don't make me give you a command. We're past that now, aren't we? A drama like was silent for a moment and she could feel his anger festering in the back of her mind like an old wound. Fine, the demon said at last, and she felt his anger fade. What's the play? Good boy. Lindsay walked up the driveway toward the front door, cradling the doll in her arms. She told people the doll housed her spirit medium, a friendly Native American soul who helped her identify and remove supernatural activity. Most clients ate that shit up. Those that didn't just thought the doll was weird, but accepted it as part of the whole kooky parapsychologist thing. It's pretty typical, Lindsay said to the demon. A couple of yuppies are hearing noises, rattling, babies crying, that kind of stuff, and smelling smoke when there's no fire. They've got overactive imaginations, and they're convinced their home's haunted. We're just going to make sure they believe it 100% before we leave. Then we come back, do the clearing, collect the fee, and we're down the road. Babies crying. Smoke. A Adromalek said. Lindsay detected a hint of interest from the demon and stopped a few yards from the front door. Does that mean something to you? No. Nope. A Adromalek said. It's just out of the ordinary. Lindsay stood for a moment, trying to tell if the demon was lying to her. He could still do that, despite the spell that bound him to her service. Adromalek hadn't held anything back from her as far as she knew. But he was still a demon, and fair dealing wasn't exactly in his nature. She elected to hedge her bets with a bribe. Look, look, if this thing goes smoothly, we'll pick up another season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer on the way home. To keep the demon occupied, she often set his doll in front of the TV and let him watch what he wanted. Adromalek's tastes ran to reality shows and anything that dealt with the supernatural, which the demon found howlingly funny. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was one of his favorites. Really? Adromalek's eagerness was naked. Season four? Yep, yep. Just do your part? Help me without any bitching, and you've got 20 plus hours of Sarah Michelle Geller and company headed your way. Lindsay suppressed a smile. She knew that the demon would take the bait. Deal, Adromalek said. And when did the disturbances begin, Sandy? Lindsay said, 
directing her question to the short, mousy woman seated on the couch across from her. Lindsay had set a dromalek in the love seat next to her, so he could see and hear everything happening in the Miller's living room. Right now, he was looking at Mrs. Miller, who was hands down the most ordinary-looking human a dromalek had ever seen. Her soul was a bunch of vanilla custard dumped inside of a boring, sad sack body. About a month ago, Robert Miller said, before his wife could speak. He was seated next to her, one hand resting lightly on her leg. Whereas Sandy Miller was white bread dull, her husband was a malignant diamond. His soul was a lump of black slime, pulsating in the middle of his chest, wretched, warped, and wonderful. To put it in no uncertain terms, Robert Miller was a monster to make a demon proud. Uh Uh-huh. Lindsay nodded. Can you describe the events? She glanced at a Dromalix doll seated on the love seat next to her. You getting anything? She thought at him. A Dromalix considered telling Lindsay about Robert Miller, but then decided against it. It was a small rebellion but small rebellions were all he had. No, no, he said. This place is as clean as a nun's twat. Crows, let me know if that changes. Well, we started hearing noises about a week ago. Sandy Miller said. Bumps in the wall and what sounded like babies crying in the middle of the night. That's pretty common with a haunting. Lindsay said, nodding sagely. Anything else? Uh, The smoke, Robert Miller said. Like I told you on the phone, we've been smelling smoke in the house for the past week. Like burnt pork or something. Do you... do you think we're haunted? Mrs. Miller asked. Her eyes were wide and fearful. I'll do a thorough investigation of your home, Mrs. Miller. Lindsay said. I'll determine if a supernatural presence is the source of your problems. If there is a paranormal factor, I will remove it. A drama like had heard Lindsay lay down her shtick a dozen times, scaring gullible idiots into paying thousands of dollars to be rid of ghosts. It was all nonsense, of course. There were no ghosts. Human souls didn't linger. They went to heaven or hell as intended. The few real hauntings were just bored demons creating havoc for kicks. That's what he'd been doing when Lindsay trapped him. Still, Adromalek's interest peaked at some of the details of this case. It wasn't your typical bump-in-the-night bullshit. In fact, it was pretty damn specific. And familiar. He moved his focus away from Lindsay and the Millers, scanning the house. He was supposed to be waiting for cues from Lindsay to shake some picture frames, rattle the floorboards, or even throw his voice down the hall. It was all the demon mojo he could muster in his current form. Well, and the stink, which he could control, but told Lindsay otherwise to fuck with her. He wanted to turn his head, but moving the doll so overtly would piss off Lindsay. Still, he had other senses beyond sight and hearing. It only took a few seconds to locate the other. It was a familiar sensation. Comforting, almost. It had been a long time since he'd encountered another demon. You look ridiculous, Adromalek, Bale said from across the room, revealing himself as a shadowy bat-winged shape hunched on the floor next to Mr. Miller, visible only to Adromalek. One smoky, spade-claw hand was wrapped around the man's leg, and Adromalek could feel Bale's corruption worming its way through the human's body and soul. He was instantly jealous. Have pity, Adromalek said. I'm trapped like this for another sixty years. We're demons. We don't have pity. Who's the woman? Bale said, nodding his shadowy head toward Lindsay. Parapsychologist and charlatan, Adromalek said. She studied some real demonology, though, so be careful. Bullshit, Bale said. She's no priest. Suit yourself, Adromalek said. If you wind up bound to a My Pretty Pony, don't complain to me. Bale's bravado wasn't entirely unwarranted. 
He was a demon of the First Order, a great duke, who commanded 60 legions in the Infernal Army. Of course, that army hadn't done jack shit since the beginning of time, leaving one of its most important generals free to slum it on Earth. You working for her or something? Bale said. His eyes flashed crimson in the wispy darkness of his face. That's kind of pathetic. Look, I'm making the best of a bad situation, Adramalek replied. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't piss on my parade. Are you going to tell her about me? Mr. Miller has given me quite a bit of enjoyment. I won't say anything if I don't have to, Adramalek said. What's this guy's deal, anyway? His soul looks like liquefied dog shit. You do that. Bale laughed. <laughs> Found him that way. All I've been doing is nudging him a bit. Adding some spice to that rotten little soul of his. Hey, are you paying attention? Lindsay's voice broke into Adromalek's mind. Adromalek pushed Bale's thoughts away and focused on Lindsay. I'm here. I don't think Hubby is convinced yet, he said. Robert Miller's eyes were locked on Lindsay, and his right hand was clenching and unclenching the arm of his chair. Understood, Lindsay said. I'll look for a way to nudge him along. Be ready. I think it might help if I were to show you where the disturbances are most common, Ms. Wallace, Robert Miller said. The eagerness in his voice was unmistakable and Adromalek could feel the surge of malice in the room. It was like sweet perfume, the subtle scent of human evil that was ambrosia to a demon. My boy is about to make his pitch, Bale said. Yes, please, Mrs. Miller said, also quite eager. Maybe something will happen while you're here. Okay, um, where have the disturbances been concentrated? Lindsay said. Uh, the basement, Robert Miller answered. I have a workshop down there. I, I like to tinker a bit. Uh, I've smelled smoke and heard strange noises more times than I can count. These two are starting to creep me out, Lindsay said to Adromalek. You getting any weird vibes? She's talking to you, isn't she? Bale said. She's getting nervous, right? Adromalek was silent for a moment weighing his options. He replied to Lindsay, stalling for time. Nah, they're fine. I'll see about making some noise in the basement when you get down there. Nice, Lindsay said. That should seal the deal. Why don't we work together on this one? Bale said, his eyes glinting. His excitement caused him to become more visible, revealing the scaly ruin of his face. Bale was ugly even by demonic standards. A tempting offer, Adromalek admitted. But after, could you free me? He tried not to sound too desperate. He saw something that looked like a frown in the shifting mass of shadows that made up Bale's face. No, the demon said after a long pause, and Adromalek knew it was the truth. But we could make your handler pay, Bale added. That was the truth, too, and the malevolence in Bale's voice was immensely pleasing. I'm not surprised, Lindsay said. Spirits often seek the lowest point of a house. Psychic energy tends to gather there. If Adromalek had eyes, he would have rolled them. Lindsay was ad-libbing, but her total bullshit was delivered with such conviction that no one ever called her on it. She was in full snake oil salesman mode again, confident as hell with her pet demon by her side. It made him sick and angry. Robert Miller stood. Let me show you the basement, Ms. Wallace. Lindsay stood as well and picked up her purse. Sure, she said. Let's go and have a look. Time to shit or get off the pot, Bale said. You joining me for playtime? Adromalek did not reply. 
and he moved the doll's head an imperceptible few inches to watch Lindsay and Robert disappear down the hall to the basement door. Robert Miller opened the door to the basement, trying to control the shaking in his hands. She was so pretty, so vulnerable, so full of life and energy. If it wasn't for the whisperer urging him to wait, to hold off because it would be so much better when they got down to the workshop, he might have given in right there. Let me get the light, Ms. Wallace, he said, reaching past her to flick the switch. The motion brought him close to her, and he could smell her perfume, the shampoo in her hair, and maybe, yes, just the subtle hint of her sweat. It was a personal stink that excited him. He loved the smells both inside and out. It was the best part. He began reaching for the short, hooked Spiderco folding knife in his back pocket, almost unaware he was doing it. No, not yet, the whisperer said, and Robert's excitement dwindled, became more manageable. He moved his hand away from the knife. Thank you, Ms. Wallace said. You can call me Lindsay. After you, Lindsay, Robert said, smiling. It was the fake smile, the one the whisperer had taught him, the one that made the women trust him. He looked over his shoulder at his wife. She was standing at the end of the hall, her hands clasped before her. He smiled at her, a different smile, the one he only showed her. It said, let me do what I need to do and things will be normal again. He had told Sandy the noises and smells came from the whisperer. She believed him, even though she couldn't hear it. They scared her, but when Robert did his work, she knew they stopped for a while and her husband was hers again. He didn't let her go down to the basement and she didn't ask questions. Sandy knew her place, and she wanted to keep it. Lindsay started down the steps, and Robert followed, pulling the door closed behind him. The steps led down to an expansive basement, mostly unfinished. Robert had installed fluorescent lights overhead, and they cast a bright white glow over the new washer and dryer, racks containing bleach, detergent, and other household cleaners and two wooden work tables. The tables were just for show. He did his real work elsewhere. What do you do down here? Lindsay asked, moving into the center of the room. Uh, tinker, mostly, Robert replied. Do you build things? He smiled. No, I'm much better at taking things apart. Soon... Wait, let her put it together. Let her be afraid before you begin. The Whisperer always knew how to make it right, how to make it better. What's behind that? Lindsay asked, pointing to a door in the wall he'd put up to separate the basement into two large rooms. That's where I keep my tools, he said. Most of the noise and smells have been coming from there. You should take a look, Lindsay said. She was confident, and there was no hint of fear or even unease in her voice. It bothered him. It felt like she was in control. That was wrong. This was his space. Patience, the whisperer said. Absolutely, Robert said to Lindsay, and reached into his pocket for the key. That door was always locked. He crossed the room, put the key in the lock, and opened the door. There was a light switch inside, but he didn't turn it on. Not yet. Lindsay took a step into the room and then another. Dark in here. Can you turn on the light? Sure, Robert said. He was trembling with excitement now. She was so close. He flicked on the light. The room was bathed in white, revealing his tools and racks on the walls, and his work table, 
its granite top stained with the leavings of his last project. He had left them because he liked the smell, an old coppery tang, and the ripe odor of opened boughs. It was enough to remind him of the work until the whisperer said it was okay to do another project. His tools were assembled from a variety of cutlery and butcher shops. Hooks for hanging, small knives for delicate work, big knives for opening and digging, saws for removing unneeded parts. Robert shut the door behind him and locked it with the key. Lindsay had her back to him. What terror she must be feeling. She had to realize what was going to happen. That she was his now. He reached into his back pocket pulled out the spider co. He'd start with that. He opened the knife with an audible click, its hooked blade gleaming, hungry. This is where I do my real work, Robert said. What do you think? Lindsay didn't turn around, but he could hear her saying something under her breath. Words he didn't recognize. Kill her! The whispered voice filled his head. It sounded desperate, afraid, and that made him afraid. He took a step forward, and Lindsay turned to face him. Robert stopped mid-stride. Lindsay was holding a very large automatic pistol in her right hand, and it was pointed at his head. She must have had it in her purse. In her other hand, she held a doll, a Barbie doll in a pink dress. She was smiling, a crooked, mocking smile that both enraged and terrified Robert, and she was still speaking, louder now. The words were in a language he didn't understand. Some of them sounded like Latin, others more like grunts than actual words. Kill her! Kill her! Kill her! The whisperer howled in Robert's head. Its power was undeniable, unstoppable. He brought the knife up and lunged. The world ended in thunder and darkness. The cop was a good-looking guy, youngish and well-built. He was also incredibly stupid. He was eating up her damsel in distress act. They were standing in front of the Miller's house in the strobing lights of six police cars, a fire truck, and two ambulances. There were cops and paramedics all over the place. You're very lucky, Ms. Wallace, Sergeant Victors said. Robert Miller was a very bad man. (laughs) I was just so scared, Lindsay said, tears streaming down her face. She clutched a Dramalix doll to her chest. He came at me with the knife, and I, and I... Oh, Jesus fucking Christ, Lindsay, Adramalik said. Laying it on a bit thick, aren't you? Sergeant Victors reached out and put a hand on Lindsay's shoulder. You did the right thing. He would have hurt you. Just thick enough, I think. Lindsay thought back. I didn't want to kill him. Lindsay said. Continuing the show. I was trying to shoot him in the leg, just to stop him. But the gun kicked so much, I've only fired it once or twice. Bullshit, of course. She'd put 3,000 rounds through her SIG 220 and could shoot one-inch groups at 30 yards. She'd been carrying the gun in her purse for years. Parapsychology attracted all kinds of freaks. Sergeant Victor stepped close. I'm glad you killed that son of a bitch, he said. Who knows how many women you saved tonight, starting with his wife. Lindsay glanced over to see where Sandy Miller was sitting in the back of one of the ambulances, a blanket wrapped around her, a vacant look on her face. She was long past saving, Lindsay thought. Do you, do you think he's killed a lot of people? Lindsay asked. Genuinely curious. Sergeant Victors licked his lips and glanced around. I shouldn't tell you this, but I will, because I want you to understand that you did the right thing and that you had no other choice. We found evidence of at least two victims. He kept... trophies. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, he looked guilty for saying them. 
Lindsay repressed a real shudder. Can, can I go home now? She asked, squeezing a few more tears out to seal the deal. Sergeant Victors nodded, obviously eager to change subjects. We need to get a complete statement from you, but I don't see why we can't do that tomorrow after you've had some time to get yourself together. Officer Johnson will follow you home. He indicated another cop standing a few feet away. Thank you, Sergeant, Lindsay said. Should I ask for you at the station tomorrow? Yes, ma'am, he said and smiled at her. I'll take your statement personally. Now, get some rest. Lindsay reached out and took one of Sergeant Victor's hands and squeezed it. You've been so kind. Thank you. I'm... I'm just doing my job. He said and blushed, but he held Lindsay's hand for a few seconds before letting go. No wedding ring, Lindsay thought at a dramalek as they walked toward the Honda. Couldn't hurt to have a friend in the police department, the demon admitted. They reached the car and Lindsay popped the trunk. She put a dramalick inside. You did a hell of a job tonight, she said and meant it. There was no doubt in her mind that things could have gone very badly, that Bale and Robert Miller could have ended her life in a way she could hardly imagine. She also knew that Adramalek had had a choice, and he'd chosen her. She didn't know why, but it didn't matter. She was never one to focus on what could have been. Maybe the demon had some infernal version of the Stockholm Syndrome. Still, he had been loyal. He had warned her, and for that, he deserved a reward. You know, she said, I see two full seasons of Buffy in your future. Really? A dramalek replied, so eager. Four and five? You got it. She reached into her purse and pulled out the birthday wishes Barbie doll, smoothing down its pink frilly dress. How are you doing in there? She thought at Bale. There were no words in the reply, just a hurricane of rage and power that buckled her knees. She pulled away, shaking her head. It might take a little longer to tame this one. Maybe a drama that could help with that. Lindsay put the Barbie doll next to the Raggedy Ann. Play nice, she said out loud. And just before she closed the trunk, she heard a drama muffled voice. Hey, hey, Bale. Do you like Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Author's Note I wrote Scare Tactics shortly after the movie The Conjuring was released. A demonic possession has always been a favorite horror trope of mine, and I found that particular movie creepy enough to be inspiring. The bit that inspired me the most is in the first ten minutes of the film, where the Warrens, the parapsychologists that serve as the main protagonists in the story, free a group of college girls who have been tormented by a demonic spirit that has taken possession of a doll. I thought, hey, what if the Warrens weren't the upstanding individuals they are in the movie and decided to use the demon doll for their own material gain? And from that question arose the characters of Lindsay and Adremelik. Supposing real hauntings are rare, a parapsychologist with a pet demon who can make things go bump in the night at will would clean up performing fake exorcists for gullible idiots. I tend to like a little humor in my horror, so the relationship between Lindsay and Adremelek is less master and slave, and more manipulative employer and put-upon employee. Of course, the fun twist in the story is exploring that relationship when Adremelek runs into one of his old demon pals and has the chance to take some real revenge on Lindsay. Well, I hope you enjoyed Scare Tactics. I certainly had fun writing it. I kind of think Lindsay and Adremelek have more stories to tell, and I think I'll return to this pair of supernatural miscreants someday in the near future. Thanks for listening. All right, so The Conjuring, that was the movie that came out like the same time as there was another magic movie that had like Christian Bale in it. And You're Hugh thinking Jackman. of The Prestige and the one with Edward Norton and uh, Jessica Biel in it, right? Uh, like the magician or the, the music man? Yes. <laughs> too fast, so. too furious is what you're thinking of. No, The no, Conjuring was a, Conjuring was not was a, a very low budget horror film. It came back out just a couple of years ago. One of those that James Wan made and uh, or uh, 
Bloom House, the, the 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 you know they they make them for like less than a million dollars, and then they okay. end up making like eighty million dollars domestic. And it was really successful. And they did a sequel, The Conjuring Two, and then they did a spinoff about the doll itself called Annabelle, which was successful enough that they made an Annabelle too. Oh, nice! So it's like Scorpion King already. It's like this is like the whole mummy cinematic universe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the that. way your face just fell as I called it a cinematic universe. It's too bad this isn't on video. <laughs> that was The Conjuring. <laughs> okay, so I'm not thinking of the correct uh, movie. Because I saw The Prestige. I As did I. I didn't see whatever the other one was called, which you also couldn't remember the title of. I should be able to remember it. I, I was working at your job, at your ex-job, <laughs> when that came out. And just after my shift... I just went and I drove over to the theater and I watched that all by my lonesome. Why can't I remember what it was called? It's It was like the blank, right? Yeah, it was like the magician or the... Whereas the prestige has some kind of a unusual title. This other one was just the magician or magicians. But it doesn't matter. It's not that important. We're going to move on because it's not even got any relation. No, to what it doesn't. We're actually talking about... So, in other words, I don't know what he's talking about in that um, author's note. I just explained it to you. In that, but I get the general idea because he explained it well enough to to know what scene he was, what the scene was like that he was uh, speaking of. The illusionist, I think, is what it was called. Ah, there you go. Okay, close. It was not magician, but... But, you know, you don't have to have seen Conjuring to enjoy this story. Oh, not at all. I enjoyed the story and I didn't see Conjuring. So that's already been proven. Me too. Okay. Um, usually we do an author's note. It's been, it's been a long time since we've done this Wasn't show. that just the author's note that we listened to? Usually we do a, a cast list. Ah. It's been so long that... Uh, <laughs> that you don't even know what a, a cast list is and you're thinking it's an author's note at this true. point. Uh, yeah, it has been a while. We've focused much more on our own stories, and so we don't do an author's note when it's our own stories because... The whole episode. Yeah, that's just, what did you think when you wrote this, Mr. Author? And then you say, well, I thought this, Mr. Host of the show. It always involves Dakota Fanning's younger sister. I don't know why the author's note's always going to that area, but it's mildly disturbing, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, Unsettling. We really ought to stop asking that Rich Outfield guy for author's notes, really. Uh, so uh, give us your, uh, I don't know, your best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. No, give us your <laughs> cast list. Cast list. There okay, go. my cast list is I would have, I would have Edward Norton play a Dramalik, and um, Beelzebub would be played by uh, Patrick Stewart. And oh, you don't mean my cast list by like my? You want like the actual cast list? Like who we for the production it. of scare tactics that okay. we have already done. Okay, I'm sorry. Who it has been a long time. I'm, I'm yeah, you hardly confused. know where to put it. Uh, it's been so long. <laughs> uh, okay, so the female voice. What was the character's name? Do you remember? Hell no, big Anchorage. What the announcer man? That that is such an offensive voice. I'm ashamed actually to be in the same room as you, Sandy. Uh, Sandy, it's so weird, Sandy. Right. <laughs> oh, she's got it written here. I'm now my American accents are not great, but I'll give Sandy a twirl. It will be good to challenge myself. <laughs> if she comes out sounding like Bugs Bunny, just don't use it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cause she did both female voices. I, I, I mean, that's oh, s- sort of that's a, right, a new girl. rule of any time. I produce anything, and if we get a female cast person, they just okay. do all of it. Okay. The female voice was played by Margaret Essex, and uh, then the rest of it was by us, right? I believe uh, I was the the creepy un- underground workshop-having uh, husband, right? In real life, yes. <laughs> and then you were also the creature at the end. I was the, the, the Beelzebub. Demon. I, I don't think it was Beelzebub. Was it not Beelzebub? I think it was Bale? Beelzebubba. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it was Bale. I've just... Christian con- Bale. Yes, yes, I played Christian Bale. Good for you! <laughs> I've just consulted the script. And, yes, Baal was the uh, other demon. That was me then? 
I can't. You Twas. know, what? Uh, sadly, I listened to our production in preparation for the show back in June, and then we didn't do the show, <laughs> and so it's been at least like two months since I listened to it, and so, so um, I've forgotten everything. So you were the a Dramalek. Yeah, I was. And narrator? Uh, I was the narrator. How about that? As if, I mean, you guys just listened to it, so I'm sure you know who was who, because my my voice is, I, I can't disguise it. I can't sound like fake Sean Connery or something. It just doesn't happen. But see, here, try. 500. <laughs> Looks like my lucky day. I'll take the rapists for 500. Uh, that's... Therapists, Mr. Conry. That's not what your mother said. Ouch, I just bit my tongue doing that. <laughs> that hurt. Uh, I'm no longer going to attempt to be fake Sean Connery. <clears throat> Moving on. I was almost out of a job there. I thought, <laughs> thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I've heard you do it enough that maybe I can do a decent <laughs> job. I don't know. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed this story. It's the kind of thing that I really dig on. I... I the the demon being caught inside the um, what kind of a doll was it? It was just like a, it was like a Barbie or something, wasn't it? No, I oh think no, no, the Bale Barbie's... gets pu- pu- right. Christian Bale, good for you, gets put in a uh, Barbie doll at the end. Uh, it was a Raggedy Ann doll. Is that what it was? Yeah, I did just the demon caught in the doll, and it, it made me think a little bit. And I know that if this was your story, you'd probably hate for me to mention something like this. So maybe I shouldn't say it because. Uh, no, Maybe Aaron has Aaron much more hate it. confidence. Oh, he than has I actual confidence. Okay, good, yeah. good. All right. Uh, it made me think a little bit about uh, the Dresden Files books. One of my favorite characters or elements or whatever you want to call it in that book is the demon or spirit or I can't remember. I think it's a, a ghost or something like that that he has captured and magicked into this skull that he has on his shelf and he, i think his name is just bob if i remember right and it's like down in the basement on a shelf right and he'll and ask bob a always wants to be released to go and like have sex with girls or, or right yeah he just wants to go and like be a poltergeist for a day or something like that and so he's, yeah he's always got to you know do some kind of a deal with bob for bob to go get him information that he needs and this relationship uh, reminded me of that instead of The Conjuring because I've never seen The Conjuring. Um, you will. I don't know. Sorry, guys. I, I only have three or four things in my repertoire and I just go back to them again and again. It's, You'll and he, never find it. you never. Yes, that's... Oh, gosh. It just must be hellish to be in a room with me. It's like, okay, here it comes. It's gonna okay, it won't You'll never again. find it, never. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I just, I, I loved the relationship between the two of them and just, you know, the, yeah, the, what did he call it? The, the unscrupulous boss and the, the servant. The sex just... worker, yes. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it kind of has something in common with the story we did last time where a Dromalek has the chance to screw her over after she has used him or you know they've had this partnership but it's not an equal partnership yeah. she tells him what to do he's, he's her slave basically and he gets the chance to turn the tables to take advantage and he doesn't do it he he's loyal to her he yeah. helps her out he's learned and, to value the relationship or something that they have and he could cause her to get her comeuppance for doing this to him but it wouldn't set him free he'd still be stuck in that doll for another however long it was that he was chained there like another it was seven. like a hundred years yeah or something it like was that. a long time it was a little, uh, so he would still be stuck there so basically he would just be like yeah and okay now i've got a long time to wait anybody um got a season of buffy the vampire slayer I can watch? <laughs> yeah that, and they had sort of an antagonistic relationship but in in that amusing playful bantery way right where they you know they didn't actually despise one another and I don't know. I I guess I didn't even it didn't even occur to me that there would be more adventures with Lindsay and a Dromalek. But when Aaron said it in his author's note, I was like, oh, naturally, of course you would do that. When you write something and it speaks to people. Yeah, I can. Then you would want to bring that back and, and, and come up with other scenarios where we can revisit these characters. Yeah, I can definitely see this being a novel. 
when he says there are more adventures, I immediately think, oh, yeah, you could write a bunch of them and collect them together into a, a collection. And it's, you know, the Adramalek and Lindsay show. Da, 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 da. But, you know, you put them all together like I've been telling you, you need to do with the birth of the sidekick stories, you know, put those all together into one big collection. And I have a book I was telling you about today that was that I read when I was in sixth grade, I want to say it was. And it was called The Mad Scientists Club. And this was a bunch of short stories that a guy had written. And I want to say they were published in Boy's Life magazine back in like the 50s. Then they were collected into a novel called The Mad And it was just, you know, these kids had like four adventures or something like that. And, you know, it was made into basically a novel. And I loved it. I don't know. I just, I thought that was really neat. But just the, that's, I guess, kind of a, an alternative novel. You know, I mean, it's... For people like me who are incapable of writing a novel, <laughs> you can collect well, stories and pass it as a novel. Is that what you're saying? To tell the truth, you've written a novel, so... But yes, yeah, exactly. You know, you can write several short stories that the same characters take part in, and then that is a novel, I guess, when you put it all together. I think it's been done uh, several times, especially I've found with children's novels. Uh, very like for example the graveyard book you know that everybody it's uh neil gaiman's you know big i think it won like the newberry award or something like that and it was you know his big children's novel i think he's written others since but like that was his big first one and it was got all these accolades and you read it it's not a, a novel there is a through line sort of but it almost feels like it was tacked on. You know what I mean? There's like the little, oh, the jacks of all trades are having a little meeting. We're going to throw this thing here in the middle just so that you don't forget that they exist. But we're not going to bring them back until the very last chapter, which is the last short story of the book. But the Graveyard Book was published as the Graveyard Book? Or I've... were these short stories that appeared elsewhere and then they collected on? I think it was published as a book, but I don't know. I could be I wrong. I, if, I feel like you're right. But I remember when I read that thinking. Yeah. What? It's like, this story's Why? not connected to that one. And this one's not connected to that one. They could have just been put out as short stories completely separately. And maybe they were written that way. Maybe he wrote them over time. And then one day, he thought, you know what? I should just, you know, put in this and that. And then boom. Novel. Newberry Award. Yes. Is it that easy? <laughs> Holy cow. I hear about these people. And it is like... for Neil Gaiman, I think. It's one of those people that just... Gold flows out of his pen. Yes. Chalupa for you, Rish. Sorry. Yeah, if if there are more adventures of... If there are more episodes of the Lindsay and the Drama Like Show... Here's your host, Fake Announcer Man. The, You're mocking me, aren't you? No, no. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, if there are more stories in this series, that would be really neat to... Uh, to see them, to read them, to, to produce, produce them. them on our show. But the show is going away, so thanks. <laughs> no, that's but no just thanks, me. Aaron. <laughs> A E R Y N. <laughs> At least it starts with A and ends yeah. in N. But I knew a boy whose name was Aaron. No. Spelled with an E. No. E R I N was his name. Oh my gosh! I knew a guy named Merrill. But what? not M E R Y L like Meryl Streep, but just like a weird non version, like like the last name. Yeah, like like Merrill Lynch. Yes, exactly. Oh my gosh, that's the worst. Can you imagine the hell of going through yeah. it? Like and I can't. No. <laughs> and now it's time to talk about something completely different. All right. What is a young man abandoning his home and the safety of the great city to wander through the canals of Mesopotamia? What is he looking for? Love? Civilization? God? I, John David Duke Jr., greet you from Buffalo, New York, where I live with my dear bride and our four boys. We are butted up against the Niagara Falls, just north of Lake Erie, with the skyline of Toronto in plain view over Lake Ontario. I teach part-time in Canada with an expertise in the ancient Near East, especially its poetry. From those poems, I've developed some ideas about how we come to relate to each other when we're surrounded by war. 
So I wrote a story, set in an imagined world before the ancient Near East came to be, to explore those ideas. And I'd be delighted if you'd stop by Patreon slash John David Duke Jr. and enjoy my hospitality. Anybody want to paint it? Normally, when we do our post-show thing, we just complain about stuff, but I think that's because it's our stories. And I don't really have anything to complain about with this story because it's actually good instead. So um, I think we can just sum up and just say we really enjoyed Aaron's story. Yeah, it was rad, and I, I'm i excited at we, the idea of more. Yeah, we hope that when there are more that we can get a look at them and possibly uh, use them on the show. So I guess that's it for us for today. If you would like... There's a donate button on the show page still at doonsteef.com. You could donate to the show. Hopefully soon we'll get a Patreon for the show. It's something we should have done years ago. I think we need a Patreon for this show, for That Gets My Goat, for the Ankle Cast. You have one already for the Rish Outcast, though, right? So if you like Rish Outfield, you should uh, seek help. <clears throat> and you could also... Donate to his Patreon. Wait, wait, what was that you said about if they liked my... <laughs> nothing, nothing. Moving on. Oh, because uh, I, I thought that you said that they needed to... No, no. I, that was probably the voice in your head that said that. But yeah, you could uh, become a patron of the Rich Outcast if you would like. Uh, how would they do that, Mr. Rich Outfield? Is there a button on your blog or how would they just go to patreon and search your name or how do they come by that's you? that's usually the easiest thing yeah just if you go to patreon.com they don't have like a slash rich outfield for me it's patreon.com and then slash and there's a, a uh, number a I'm million num- numbers and letters all just but kind of in a random order i wonder why they don't just have names and if you've got know. a common name they're like oh sorry mark smith is already taken can you mark W. Smith, Mark W. J. Smith. Mark Smith, too. Right. But, uh, if yeah, if they want to support me, they get some exclusive content, they get episodes early, and they get to encourage me to actually produce that yeah. show and show Yeah, see, the encouragement is always good. That's probably why we need a Patreon for this show. Absolutely. So that we can kick it up a notch and actually make some. Uh, so, yeah, go to uh, patreon.com and search for Rich Oldfield. Wait, what, what? <laughs> What did you say? And donate to his show, whoever the hell that is. Don't support Rich Oldfield. He, he's mildly racist. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. You need someone that's much more racist, so that's right. support Somebody Rich Oldfield. Out uh, I wanted to mention that I first met, I didn't ever, I've never met Aaron, but I first came across Aaron, which it sounds even worse. I first uh, <laughs> encountered Aaron... By doing a story of his for Pseudopod called Night Games. Oh. And you can find my reading. Maybe we'll put it in the show notes. But it's over there in Pseudopod Night Games. It's a horror baseball story. Oh. Which are, there aren't a lot of. Yeah. Them. Well, maybe there are. but uh, This is a whole actually really thriving sub-genre, subgenre yeah. of horror baseball stories. Somebody saw Field of Dreams and they just thought, you know, what if it was... Field what if of they were, Bad Dreams. Yeah, what if they were scary Black Sox ghosts? Yeah, Headless Joe. Was it Shoeless <laughs> Joe Jackson? Yeah, Headless Joe Head, Jackson. Headless Joe Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the, people can check that out. It, it's a good story. That's how I discovered Aaron. Head over there and uh, give it a look-see. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Oldfield. And I'm an outer man. Oh, crap. Yeah, he's still back there behind the boxes. I forgot. <laughs> Boy, he scared me there. It's just one Ooh. of those where it's like my arm hairs are still sticking up. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming, announcer man. Screw you guys. I'm going home. Okay, well, it's time to anyway, so... Uh... Perfect timing? I'll miss him. <laughs> All right, folks. We'll see you next time. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you can't sell or change the files. Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all. Take two.
Chunder, chunder, would you like some? A Dremelec. Yeah, I think we called him something different. Like Mike. That's <laughs> all the time we've got for today, folks. Thank you for listening. Please tip your waitresses. Announcer man is dead. I kiss you all over. And over again. Uh, uh. I want to kiss you all over. Till the night closes in. Till the night closes in. Scare Tactics by Aaron Rudel. No, no, no. It's Aaron Rudel. Oh. Most of what's in the Dictionnaire Infernal he got from Titivillis. 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 There you go. Oh. Yes. Do it again. Yep. Just do your part, help me without any bitching, and you've got 20 plus hours of Sarah Michelle Gellar and company headed your way. Do you ever say the name Sarah Michelle Gellar as Gellar? You belong in hell. <laughs> it was enough to remind him of the work until the Whisperer said it was okay to do another project. His tools were assembled from a variety of cutlery and, and butcher sh- <laughs> <laughs> you getting aroused? No, I'm trying to make it seem like I am, though. I was over aroused on that sentence. Win the battle, lose the war. Choice of evil lies before. You're uh, riffing on it, man. I love it. <laughs> I like it. That what you taught me last week? <laughs>